What's up, Bildungselite? I've got a new international guest for you, and it's an honor again to have the chat on. Well, actually, you have to introduce yourself with your with your voice. Come on, James, do it. The, the shed. I don't. The shed. <laughs> James Holling had James yeah. Holling's head in the house. Thank you, man, for taking your time. Appreciate it. And thank, thank you, brother. You Appreciate for joining this podcast. Yeah, man, on it. And uh, like I uh, quickly said before we went on, really nice to talk to a, a, a different audience. So it's amazing. Um, you know, obviously before Brexit, I was a European lad, and uh, you know, I feel like we've got a lot of similarities in many things. So it's really great to have an opportunity to talk to you. Absolutely, it's time to get Europe back on the screen, right? For sure. Any opportunity we take here. Absolutely. Team yeah. Europe. <laughs> Team Europe. Yeah, thanks for taking your time because I you're not only one of my favorite bodybuilders, to be honest, because I've listened to almost every uh, Fuel podcast since episode one. And I really love that you're open about everything, not only like dosages and so on, but also about your feelings, which is something I want to talk about later. Cool, but I think the most important question that everybody has is asking themselves right now is a week ago you called yourself or a month ago you called yourself uncoachable in words podcast yeah and now you've started working with Stefan <laughs> <laughs> uncoachable by most um you know How what has Stefan, your changed do you know it's the right it's finding the right person for me man it's like any relationship isn't it you just yeah. got to feel secure in it and if you feel like there's any insecurity in it it doesn't work and i just found that for a long time i didn't have that security um i think the last time i really felt that was with like patrick mm -hmm. um and i've kind of been waiting for that to come about and i hadn't had it and you can't really tell you got it until you talk to someone a little bit and get to know them because obviously for me like coaching and client some people it's very much just black and white business i don't really talk to people unless i enjoy talking to them so it has to be something a little bit more which isn't necessarily the best way or the worst way it's just the way i am because obviously if it's someone that's going to be in my life and i talk to regular i want to enjoy my conversations with them and feel very comfortable and that's it really and uh, i just found that with stefan we had spent a few days around each other around the two arnolds because he was just there okay and i just felt the communication was like really easy and fun uh and i've known him since about 2019 you know not extremely well but i've always been fond of his character and everybody i know speaks so highly of him friends of mine here like kuba um you know jordan peters my circle you know the boys that i trust they're all very um much team stefan and that makes it a lot easier for me to then have that that trust and that i suppose entry point into building a relationship with someone um so that's really it for me. It's mm -hmm. just a trusting, feeling comfortable, disclosing myself to somebody and exposing myself and giving everything to someone. Because I feel like, what's the point working with someone if you can't empty out everything and let them know exactly where you're at mentally, physically, and what your ambitions, etc. Absolutely. So, so let's get back a few years. You have been with Patrick. Yep. Great coach. After... The Olympia, I think two or three years ago, you decided to do it on your own. Yeah, 2021, which, yeah, after you know, things hindsight. The way. Yeah. Yeah. And if I had, and you know what, that was a bad call on my behalf. And I actually spoke to Patrick the other day and I feel so good for doing it. Um, I reached out to Patrick when I was in Sweden, just sent a personal message and I just explained a lot of feelings and, um, you know, insecurity and uh, immaturity from my behalf. And uh, I just wanted to reach out whether he replied or not, just to say, look, this is how I feel. And I do think you're a great person and whatnot. Uh, and I was fortunate enough to get a, a good reply and we're on good terms. And I feel so much better in life because of that. Because uh, I, th I think Patrick's a wonderful person. And he was in my life at a time where um, I kind of needed a father figure and he kind of stepped up to that role. Mm -hmm. And I've always said to Patrick that he kind of feels like that to me. And I, and I, I still feel that way about him. I feel like he's someone that, I look up to uh, and have a lot of respect for um, in that kind of way. Like I feel like he's someone I can talk to about life direction, you know, anything. Cause I really, really trust his opinion and uh, just think he's a great person. And some of his life experiences and mine kind of collaborate well, things that he has in experience 
with his relationships with people and mine with people were like kind of from the other end so it's almost like we kind of meet in the middle and agree on a lot so yeah he's a great person i'm glad i had time to work with him he obviously done a fantastic job you know two pro wins uh, olympia qualification arguably some people think that was my best ever so mm -hmm. i'm forever grateful to patrick but going back to patrick was not an option uh i never asked because i'm just okay. you know first and foremost you know heal the wounds as best as you can and never rush or push or force anything mm -hmm. and it's never to say it wouldn't happen again um we're on talking terms and i'm so happy we are and that's a start you know so um you know if me and patrick later down the road ever decided to do that it, would, it wouldn't be a bad thing and uh you know mm -hmm. we did wonderful together so who knows but um you know right now i'm really i feel like stefan's a very you know because they're both european <laughs> True. <laughs> I, i've got this thing where i just kind of like their opinions on mine just seem to match and uh, yeah. there's a lot yeah. of similarities between them in regards to their approach to bodybuilding which is actually really nice but after working with patrick you took some time off and worked with no coach at all you no yourself? i just bounced ideas off me and yeah. jordan jordan's yeah. obviously my friend i say i'm gonna do this what do you think if he says you're being mad don't do that then i would kind of listen if he thinks it's a good idea which you know i prepared myself for the tsunami cup and the arnold mm -hmm. uk 2022 managed to managed to get a pro win right get to the olympia again so i was kind of like i must know something <laughs> um and then obviously did the olympia you know didn't quite get it right but it's all learning and that was 2022 i actually took 2023 off because i had surgery for gynecomastia mm -hmm. um which i'm super glad i got done because i feel a lot more confident now there was a point where i didn't even want to show my physique with a t-shirt off to anybody even people close to me um and it's really weird how it onset so late in my career a lot worse than it ever had um because i always had a little bit but it was never really noticeable and then i just had this period where it just went i was like whoa that's a bit weird happening now i'm not doing anything that different um but i can attribute that probably to quality of what was available supplement wise yeah. things not being what they say on the tin maybe mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know so however after that you decide to work with milos and yeah I well i think i overheard in the podcast with chris tuttle that you said that you adored the the passion that milos brings to the sport. yeah so milos i was like really happy to work with and i had some time where i just followed a plan and that was okay. my off season off season i was happy to follow but it got to a point where i just felt rough didn't feel great and I did say to him, I said, look, dude, like emotionally, like this off season's making me feel pretty, pretty low. Um, Why? I just think a combination of all the, the drugs and the uh, food pushing up and pressure on myself and just everything, you know, it's just a combination of force feeding, training heavy, uh, taking anabolics. And I always think people underestimate how much anabolics play a role in how you feel. Everyone always shrugs it off and says, yeah, they don't make me feel any different. I feel good. They have a massive effect, especially if you don't agree with a certain one, like everyone's different, but someone could take one thing and have a, a detrimental effect, whereas others could really just get positive effects. And I was, whatever I was doing, was just making me feel almost suicidal. And it wasn't his fault. It's no one's fault. It's yeah, yeah. I'm the one I've said, yes, I'll do it. Um, and I think life at the time, just a lot of changes happening. You know, it was before the gym and trying to just, I don't know, trying to secure a good future on top of, you know, trying to get back on stage after a year off and the pressure that people put on you. They're like, oh, you're shit. You're never going to be as good as you were or your best days are over. So sometimes, you know, you're allowed that to get in your head a little bit and you, you know, have that going on on top of you know pushing your weight up and having heavy cycles which affect you tremendously from a mental standpoint it just all kind of bleeds into a bit of a, a cesspit of yeah. shit emotion and that's where i was at really. in germany milos has a reputation of the guy that tries to well the dosages are that high so he just sees how much can the body take before it breaks down is it true with me, it wasn't so much away because I made it very clear before what I did last time I competed yeah. and how much I did. So there was already a set 
precedent of my allowance what i'm willing to do um because i'm not someone that will, that's what i mean about being coachable you can't come to me and say you're doing this because i have resistance i'll say yeah. no yeah because i've got experience yeah so my experience always comes to the forefront of my mind and if something feels off i would say uh milos was very respectful with my dosages he wasn't crazy at all to okay, be okay. fair um he didn't try to push you no not really okay. and the only thing that made me feel a bit rough is when we put some uh dynabol in mm -hmm. and that's probably just because it's not something i normally use and you know probably trace amounts of that would probably make me feel awful mm -hmm. and listen there'll be a lot of people that listen to this podcast because i get it all the time now say james is chatting shit he's pushing way more drugs than you say well you know i don't think i look that bad for my freaking age i know i've got no hair but if you look at my skin quality in that i don't know if this looks like someone that really 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 pushes the drugs True. um because I do want longevity, you know. I'm someone that does care about being here for as long as I can be. Um, have I pushed drugs in the past? Certainly on my own accord. I'm like, let's see what I can get away with because you experiment, you want to know. And there are times in bodybuilding where you're like, are the pros doing something I'm not? Is it just that they're doing more? So everyone has a period where they're like, I'll try something to see because, you know, if you don't try, you don't know. So there was times when I was pushing 1250 testosterone a week. Um, but... Honestly, it doesn't do any more than being on about 700. <laughs> so what's the point? Um, yeah, you made your experiences and you found your sweet spot, right? For sure. Like, yeah. you just get to a point where, yeah, you might get quite a lot of potential muscle growth from it, but it comes a lot, along with a lot of other stuff like digestive issues, mental, uh, you know, disruption, uh, lack of sleep, acne, you know, just other things that are just not needed. So you're worth growing a little bit less but quality without all the other things that you know come in addition when you perhaps push things too far you know even in an off season for me like two compounds is really enough i'd probably just do testosterone and one other compound that i like um i know a lot of people think that the pros do like five six things and you know make a massive cocktail but honestly i think the longer you bodybuild for the more you know you can eliminate certain things and not lose any um i suppose potential improvement from it mm -hmm. because you just realize that a lot of it's just wastage mm -hmm. just money spent or injections done that you don't need to do so um that's that's kind of where i'm at now like with stefan stefan's just without going too far into the future he's kind of just pulled everything out and just letting me just freshen up which is actually really nice my brain feels good i was talking to some members at the gym today and they're like how do you feel i was like well i'm talking to you and i've been talking to you for about 35 minutes I feel good. <laughs> so. I want to talk about that in a second. Yeah, for but sure. First of all, I would just want to ask, um, have you worked with Milos when it came to the Arnold? So I asked Milos to be like part of my circle. So I can mm -hmm. reach out to him, ask all questions. Right. Okay. See. So the way it was, I said, Milos, look, I'll pay you for your time. Here's the money, whatever you cost. If I reach out to you, I just need you to be there to be able to give me some guidance. Yeah. Kind of like Jordan, but from another from another eye. Because Jordan believes Milos is a good coach as well. So it's basically Jordan that said Milos is a good person to listen to. So that's how I had it. I had Jordan and Milos there. And I just, if I felt I needed to ask specific questions or wasn't sure where I was going, it was great to know that I had a team there that I could bounce off. So that's what I kind of meant by uncoachable. Like yeah, a lot of the time, yeah. I do want to lead the way because I want to learn because I don't want to be useless and dumb. I, I don't want to be someone that if someone asked a question who needed help that I couldn't answer it because I never led the way. Because unfortunately, a lot of people do just follow what they're told and then you never learn. And if you never learn, how can you ever educate? Yeah. So that's why I have that way of being. It's like, if I ask Milos, what should I do? I'll also ask him why. And then once I know why and I can then translate that, that becomes part of my knowledge. And that's basically why I pay him is to do that. And mm -hmm. that's just my approach. Some people think it's odd, but listen, I'm 35 years old. I've been alive long enough to know that a service is a service. What you wish to get from it is what you wish to get from it. And no one else walks in your shoes. And I was happy with what I paid for. And I was happy with the service I received. Um, I didn't need babysitting. I didn't need full coaching around the clock. I wasn't after that. Um, I could message Milos once every seven to 10 days, maybe even less frequently and still feel like I was doing what I needed to do. So it's not necessarily the most conventional approach, uh, but it was the approach that felt right for me at the time. Uh, and, you know, I was quite happy with my delivery at the first Arnold. I thought it wasn't too bad to mm -hmm. get top five in a 
Arnold debut against 10 Olympians. Like, you know, some of those guys have beaten me and I haven't beaten them before. Yeah. So it was yeah. my first time beating them. Um, and then, you know, the quality of the lineup as well. I know it's not big, but you've got Hadi Chupan and you have Samson, which are the top three bodybuilders in the world. So that's two places basically guaranteed mm-hmm. to someone mm-hmm. else. So, and then De La Rosa is a good friend of mine and a great champion who's won, you know, Toronto Pro, uh, other shows as well. And I've been in those shows and he smoked me. Like I've been like down the pack and there's people beating me in between him and me. So for me, the Arnold was just a way to move forward a little bit as a bodybuilder in my career. Okay. So basically you have not paid Milos for coaching, but for just advice, right? So I've paid Milos what he's coaching is. So that yeah. if I need him as much as a regular client, I can. So sure. if I don't, I don't. So yeah. that was basically what I did. Do you work the same with Stefan or is Stefan Lauer like a full-time coach for you? Stefan's full-time. Okay. I'm so ready what has for changed time. since you work with Stefan? The, mostly probably just knowing that I can be better than what I was at the Arnold and I don't have the ability to attain that on my own because I don't have the experience or knowledge that is quite there yet. So I just know that I haven't got infinite time left as a bodybuilder. Yeah. So if I'm going to make a move and get coached, then I kind of have to do it now. Um, you know, I'm like, I'm very fluid as a person. Like I'm not going to, I don't necessarily feel the same way about things all the time because life changes. And that's the same with everything in my life. You know, I might condone something and then I might not, you know, a little while later because I learn or I understand it more. So just like anything in life, my opinions on things can change depending on my experiences. And I came out of the Arnold like, man, I feel like I could have been as high as third if I wasn't my best, but I can't quite get into that with what's in here. Mm-hmm. So I, I need some external um so that dictates a lot and what have you guys changed now like food wise training wise not uh, really drugs wise no drugs like i say like, literally off everything apart from testosterone it's like literally get all the thyroxins out all the growth so you're food off. <laughs> yeah so i'm literally just like feeling really good for it because your brain yes. just feels a lot clearer less foggy um and then training wise Jordan and I still do my training because mm-hmm. Stefan is, I know he's happy to do my training, but he knows what I want to work on and what he wants me to work on. And I suggested that to Jordan and me and Jordan just put together a, a nice plan. Yeah. Um, it's good because Jordan knows what machines we have, what, you know, we own a gym together. So it's like, okay, this should be used quite often for that. Uh, so it's very really easy to keep up to date with my training, having Jordan in the gym. And then obviously him and Stefan, our friends as well so he could always chime in and say james is doing this what do you think blah 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 so it's really easy for us to just work together basically uh and then in regards to the nutrition just just simplified things a little bit mm-hmm. i suppose taking out some foods um you know i'm a massive fan of eating bread and stuff but we're literally just eating rice and rice alternatives right now and i have to say my digestion feels good so i think we've I think like most people, we probably could all do with having a little bit more of a linear approach to food because some foods, although we like them and eat them, they do sometimes cause some issues, especially like breads, which is annoying because I'm definitely, I'm obviously not a celiac. I'm not like, my girlfriend's a celiac, so she eats gluten. She'll literally mm-hmm. like pass out. I'm not that, but it obviously does have an effect on my digestion uh, and my energy which is frustrating because I love bread. You know, Europeans love bread. Um, it happens the best. So I haven't really been eating any bread or anything. So, and I've been quite strict on my diet. You know, I'll, I'll message Stefan on the weekend and say, uh, is it okay to go and get a meal here? You know, because I'm out with Yannicka and it'd be nice to have a meal. And it's normally something very simple, like a good alternative, you know, steak and chips or yeah. it's never that crazy. So right now, Stefan's like, for sure, because he said, look, listen, the well, last thing we're, considered uh concerned about right now is you being razor sharp ready for a show because we're not doing one at the minute so enjoy not. yourself not in a minute there's no plans right now okay, okay. I'm, just, oh. I'm in good shape i could do one pretty much within weeks i know because I you've to. just come out of the arnold's and i was yeah. i was yeah. asking myself whether you were playing to do new york or i don't know i would have loved to but i had this little leg issue earlier in the mm-hmm. year that i'm still trying to figure out properly so i'm actually going to go over to uh, I'm going to go to Vienna and see Stefan. And he has uh, a guy 
with a really good clinic. Mm-hmm. We're just going to have a look because I can train and I've been trained okay, but I've got like something nerve going on where there's a little bit of pain in the knee and stuff. And it's been going on for about six months. So I actually prepped for the Arnold, like literally with one leg on both preps. Like, really? it's one. Yeah. And it was annoying because obviously I know I'm going against some of the best bodybuilders in the world. And I'm yeah. like, I felt like my arm was like tied behind my back, but I'm not one to back out. And if I say I'm going to do an Arnold, I'm not going to back out of that because the Arnold is such a big deal. And to be invited to that show would be disrespectful, in my opinion, to then turn around and say, I don't want to do it. So I was like, let's just go. And, uh, you know, I've got friends that have had worse injuries and come back. I always use Branch Warren as an example. Like he tore his quad six months before winning his second Arnold Classic title. So how the hell can I complain and pull out from the prep from, I haven't even torn my quad and I'm, you know, I can't be even contemplating not doing a show unless I was really, really hurt. So, yeah, I think that's is another the plan, reason why is I was the plan happy still, to Stefan. Is the plan still to qualify for this year's Olympia? Yeah, Stefan said that'd be a, a, a good plan, doable. Like, okay, yeah. And there is time. It's just, um, I'm not in a rush right now. I'm like, I just say to him, whatever like just i'll go with whatever i'm very open you know i have this thought all the time it's not how many shows you do it's what ones you do do and what ones you win right you know i said this to myself earlier like your career could look quite quiet and then one day you win an arnold classic and you're more known and more respected than anyone who was active and won loads of little shows it's just crazy how it works like stock is the show determines your stock. Obviously I like doing shows and I think it's good for my audience and it's a good way to make a living because obviously contracts and sponsors, they like you being, you know, active, Mm. but um, there is a huge part of me that's like, you want to aim big as well. So if you want to aim big, don't rush. Like sometimes it does take a bit of time and a bit of hiding away to come back and be improved enough to win the show that you do really want to win. So if Stefan said to me, Let's just take our time. I would absolutely take my time. If he says, let's go, it's time. I'll just go. So I'm I'm easily kind of led if I trust the person. And obviously, mm-hmm. like I said, I, I trust him very, very much. So mm-hmm. he will determine what we do, really, I think, this year. What convinced you to work with him? What did he say to you at the Arnold's that you were like, well, this seems to be the right decision? Do you know what? It's not what's said. It's just energy in it. Like I've seen him with his. That's the vibe between you and him. Yeah, I and mean, with him and his other athletes. I'm there sitting, laying down backstage. Yeah, and he's speaking into like Wesley's ear and Urza's ear, and he cares so much about how they are in themselves and how they feel. Like it's infectious, and I've met numerous clients since of his in Sweden, and they all sound the same and say the same thing and think about him. Mm-hmm. It's how he uplifts them and makes them have gratitude. And I think that's the best thing on earth is having gratitude. And sometimes it's easy to lose it. So if you can have a mentor who helps you encourage that feeling and bring it out more, then I think you're in a really good place. Um, like I said, I was listening to him talk to them and he's so caring. Like he gets emotional. I'm watching him nearly in tears because he wants them to do so well. And that like, he actually gives a, a, a he gives a shit about how they do, like more than anything. He would sacrifice himself to save them. That's what the sort of person he is. Like it's, you can just see it in him. He's so passionate. Like I said about Minos with the passion thing, that was a big component for me to even go where I did with him. Now I've seen like Stefan's passion. It's like, whoa, that dude would literally chop his arm off for you. It's crazy, bro. Like honestly, I can honestly say that I've not ever experienced someone so emotionally behind his people i say patrick was like that with me Mm -hmm. which is why i cared for him a lot as well there's a camera team from germany rep one i don't know if you know it yeah they uh, follow stefan around throughout the competitions and you can always see how emotional he gets he's like crying screaming jumping around it's like it means a lot to him and that's that's what's better in life like if you go through these experiences with people who it's actually meaning something to yeah, like a lot of people again listen 50 cent of the public will listen to this and are emotionless people and think that what we're saying is stupid but it doesn't matter because again as long as you appeal to your people and it's right for you and being emotional and being in the moment is the best thing especially as you get older 
and you start to appreciate the time you have because when i was younger i was motionless and just like focused because you think you've got forever to live and then you know you get a little bit older you experience some losses you, some people you care about aren't here no more so you start to realize just how important these memories are and you'll do anything to capture more and that's that's where i'm at in my life so that's why i'm like oh man i'll embrace stefan because i want more of that you know going forward in my life i want moments that make you teary that make you smile that make you cry that make you remember because when it's all said and done what else have you got wow yeah keep that in mind i'll get back to that later yeah, yeah. one more thing uh about stefan what are you aiming to improve where are your weaknesses everywhere really abdominals can be deeper yeah um because i've got like a, a strange genetic kind of make up to my abdominals and he even said it he said it's genetic he's like it's so annoying but it's genetic they're very shallow. like the tissue is very shallow and it's hard so they're rock hard but they're like not so you could train my abs and they, they won't do what abs do it's like some people's calves you know some people's calves are this long and look terrible mm -hmm. it's like how you can't elongate the mm -hmm. muscles so i can only do what i do so i've been doing like more planks and stuff um which is that's actually stefan's approach for me so i'm trying to do what i can to keep it looking good and i think it's looking all right from the pictures i've kind of you know posted with the check-ins and stuff just to keep my audience you know in the loop um and then dude muscle everywhere isn't it more arms more shoulders more back more hamstrings like there's nowhere that's really fully maxed out which is actually a blessing because i get to train everything um obviously i'm not naturally a wide guy so shoulders are obviously a big focus because mm -hmm. kind of like phil heath you know the clavicles some people have it some people don't i certainly don't so training shoulders is a priority getting some more thickness around there um and that's it really like I say more back more shoulders more hams but you can have more arms you can have there's nothing you can have more of you know and it'd be a problem You're bodybuilding never satisfied. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So obviously my training is geared towards shoulders right now and back. Yeah. That's the two areas where I'm, in terms of muscular size, trying to bring up more. What I find interesting is, I mean, you're one of the strongest bodybuilders. Literally, what you, what like when you go barbell rowing or deadlifting, yeah, you're as strong as hell, strong as a horse. Do you think that, changing the approach would benefit you like not only working on mechanical tension but maybe um do metabolic work i don't know i think um i think people don't see my training in full and they don't realize that i've been doing a mixture for a long time because i do only like, obviously i'm only going to post the sets that people get a response to yeah okay a lot of the time but if you were to watch me train uh especially with patrick patrick had me doing a lot of that work mm -hmm. because he's a sucker for multiple rep ranges and stuff like that so so you have actually done his ssd training yeah yeah i did that okay, for okay. all the while yeah. i was with him and I, I still implement stuff now that i like you know yeah. i i'm very keen on trying to keep training in a place where it stimulates you mentally and physically to actually adapt um but i'm very conscious of form you know and tempo i'm a tempo sucker like i train pretty slow and squeeze everything that i can uh try and eke out as much tension on a muscle before it gets heavy you know i'd rather fatigue myself on the lighter weight and make it heavy than go heavy um which sounds crazy because people don't associate me with that but no that's just because sometimes there's been a few sets i've done that are just worthy of recording and i just put them up but you know it would only be one exercise probably in the whole workout that looks that way mm -hmm. you know like it used to be squats you know i'll just heavy squat bench press but in the rest of the workout You would be like wow this is like a real bodybuilding workout mm, so it just depends on what you've seen me do and if you truly you know have an insight to how i train but i do think the key to me improving is to improve even how i do that type of training like you say because nothing we do is 100 spot on whether it be the way i move or you know the way i set up the movement or the order of my exercises or the amount of exercises there's always something i can improve on to then hopefully improve my physique so you know stefan and i have discussed it you know how do you engage your lats what do you start putting with before you you know is it you put in with your 
upper back you pull in first of your bicep put it with your lat like those questions are always answered but i spend most of my existence as a human thinking about that stuff around the clock like i'm always in my own head all day and it's always about asking questions how can i improve in life in business in you know relationships like so how do i move the weight that's like on my head every day i spend hours in my mind thinking could i do this better um and you can always do something better so I'll document my training and put it on YouTube and put it out there so people can see. And then, you know, if I put that on there, it's a good documentation for me to see if I have followed what I should or if I haven't. Um, but I definitely agree. I think tensional work is probably the best way at this point, and especially when you're already strong. Because mm -hmm. strength, sometimes you develop it, at the you know, and the consequence of that is that you bypass almost the hypertrophy because I feel like you can be strong and not huge. Like yeah. you can have a really strong muscle that isn't huge, yeah. but you can't have a huge muscle that isn't strong. So it, what I mean by that is that tensional work, like you said, time and tension, that is strength. It's just a different type of strength. Mm -hmm. It's a controlled strength rather than an explosive one. So I probably need to spend more time doing that. Are you working together with Jordan? Like, are you training together? No, I don't I train with him. He's very keen on progressive he'll... overload and getting strong as hell. And yeah, he's very particular. Very. He's uh. <laughs> so Jordan's maps my training exercises. Okay. So yeah. the order of what exercises and when I do them in the week. See, but you're not working all together. No, I don't work out because we would destroy us each other, man. <laughs> it would get so like we tell the time. We've done the short stints of doing it and end up just getting like sore. Yeah. And it's like if we keep doing this, dude, we're gonna be out of the game quicker than we came in. Um I would have like if if post bodybuilding, me and him decided to do like you know, squat bench dead, like max and see what we could get to by training under a certain regime, that'd be incredible. But I do think one of us would rip something off the bone. Absolutely. It's just hundred percent. Yeah. There's too much ego, too much ego. And we both got a huge ego and both want to outdo each other when it comes to lifting. So yeah. it's safe that we don't. Yeah. But you're you're both co-founders of the same gym, right? Mm -hmm. We are indeed, which is the TBJP, which is obviously Jordan yeah. and the shed. So it's the well, I think shed. going with the gym. Good, good. That's why I'm like there today, just getting involved because I'm enjoying it. I'm like, ah, oh, let's make it even better. Um, but really good so far. Great atmosphere, good clients, good uh, members. Um, is it public you know, here open or is it exclusive? Public. Nice. Public gym. So it's open to everybody of all levels. We have people that have never trained before. We have people that are advanced. We have pros. We have coaches, PTs, ladies, gentlemen, old, young. It's a really nice versatile vast demographic which is cool because everyone's just there to progress which mm -hmm. is the only message that me and jordan really enforce we're not like you have to be of a level just you have to just want to progress whether that be in your own way or our way it doesn't matter as long as you've got the mentality to want to be better that's all that matters so are you just a founder or are you also a coach oh, Corona, 50 50 yeah we own the gym 50 50 But you're not a coach. You're not like um, walking around there and helping oh, people no, in the workout. Just, me and Jordan don't do no work. Yeah, okay. We got my we got my missus Yannicka running the gym. So oh, nice. nice. We pay Yannicka a good salary to make sure everything works. And then obviously, when there's decisions that need to be made, like obviously, then she comes to us with the board. We make the decisions, and uh, she executes the plans for us and deals with her staff, so we don't uh, directly have to deal with anybody. So. Um, we just get to, you know, purchase good equipment, develop the gym how we see fit, and uh, have Yannicka as a, a great kind of, she's like our right-hand man. So she just keeps everything operating well and the system's in place, which is good. Because we don't have time. Like Jordan has the supplement company and the clothing, and then I'm, you know, full-time with this. And I have a lot of things I do other than this as well. So time is not something we have loads of. So it's really important to have someone that manages things really well and understands the brand and uh, the direction of which you wish to go with your mission, I suppose. Mm -hmm. 
What were the criteria on which you picked the machines and the equipment? Just if me and Jordan like them, we use them before and like them. If Jordan has a list of things he likes, slap him in. If I got a list of things I like, slap him in. We won't even question each other because we trust each other so much. Mm -hmm. So, you know, James, what do you like? Get it. Jordan, what do you like? Get it. Me in the middle. We'll use each other's kit as well. So the gym is pretty much that. You know, I ordered a load of stuff. He ordered a load of stuff. It all turns up. He's using stuff I ordered. I'm using stuff he ordered. We're not fans of everything, but they have to have got a pass from one of us to be in mm -hmm. the gym. Um, What's your favorite machine right now? Jeez, man. That's a hard question, really, because I like training everything, so I don't have a particular favorite. Um, what do I use the most? Jeez, man. At the minute... I'm actually quite a fan. I've just got the Jimleco T Bar Row. Jimleco is a Swedish brand, obviously. Mm -hmm. They got some nice bits. They got some nice bits. Um, just solid. I was finding it hard to find a, a regular T Bar Row that was sturdy enough to be able to keep up with Jordan. Uh, and I do have to say that this is built pretty heavy duty, even though it's a small footprint. It's a good T Bar. Um, but we got some fancy stuff, man. We got like all the prime stuff. Yeah. But then I'm not super fancy. I like basic. So. You know, of all things you asked me to pick, I'm like, yeah, T bar row. But it's just because I like simple stuff because I grew up training on very simple stuff. Um, none of this like profile adjusting stuff or the selectorized or you know, the free arms so you can change the strength curve. I was never doing that growing up, so it doesn't appeal to me as much, but it appeals to Jordan, and that's good because then we both have in the gym things that appeal to everybody because we both select things so because mm -hmm. we're an official prime training facility because we've got like 30 pieces of prime equipment mm -hmm. so it's pretty cool and a lot of people do like the prime stuff it's pretty heavy duty uh it's good quality and they have a machine for everything so the prime is very very popular stuff at the minute i'd say you embody hardcore bodybuilding and i heard on foods podcast that you were complaining about the gym culture changing yeah is there sometimes. a certain gym etiquette in your gym yeah you know like again you know like i said i'm very fluid and i come around to things mm -hmm. obviously being a gym owner you have to come around to certain things in today's kind of climate because it's not what i've come to realize is that the climate change isn't something that's no one is responsible for the times mm -hmm. are responsible for so you can't really get angry at people because it's not that one person that's decided to be that way it's that that's just the way that things have gone because of the corporate companies who promote, you know, the fitness industry and then the information that gets out there bleeds down from that. It's no one particular person. So I'm very understanding of like someone that comes in the gym now who has a total new school approach and wants to film every set. You know, I have to police things obviously so that it's uh, not a place that's uh, unpleasant for the older generation like myself, like, prehistoric bodybuilders but it, we have a fine balance and no one takes the mick you know we've got some really good people in there and even if people film i don't mind as long as they have etiquette enough to be like oh sorry let me move that out your way or do you mind if i film this set um because if you were to ask me that question like it's a year or two ago before i had the right, gym yeah. i would have obviously been like oh fucking tripods jesus christ they're so annoying just do your set but I'd, i've come around to the understanding that we're in social media time now. So even if it was another thing, if it's not even body, you know, it's like someone's getting beaten up in the street. Everyone's got their phone out filming it and then putting mm -hmm. it on TikTok. It's just, I can't, you can't change that. So mm -hmm. what you have to do is you have to manage it and make it work for you. Um, the only thing I do find a bit odd is just how many people are coaches. Because <laughs> I personally, again, I even how long I've been bodybuilding, I wouldn't be comfortable telling someone else what drugs to take yeah um simply because i don't understand the biomechanics enough because i've never cared enough for that to be the case so it'd be foolish of me to be like yeah come to me i'll tell you what to do and then i'm telling them to take trend blah 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 when i really don't know the long-term consequences of this stuff even on myself and someone that has experienced some you know mental kind of uh adversity i suppose and darkness i wouldn't want to wish that upon anyone because they everyone thinks they're everyone thinks they're invincible to that because 
just people do you know it's ego they're like yeah no it won't it won't affect me i would hate for someone to come to me get into bodybuilding and put themselves in a dark place because of the things they're taking and then they're here like six months later they've decided to or something so i just don't want that responsibility i'm happy to advise of nutrition happy to advise all that but i feel like some of these people that are just so happy to tell people to take t3 t4 growth hormone insulin like and they've done like one bodybuilding competition and they weigh less than this freaking can telling them what to do it's just absurd it's absurd to say that you're a coach it's absurd that it's not policed and that it's not got some sort of um qualification needed in place so that people are safer under the guise of unexperienced people who just want to make money that's the way i look at it and that's the one thing that bothers me absolutely and yeah. this is so important you wouldn't go to a guy who's taken paracetamol once in his lifetime and ask him for medical advice would you no and that's the problem that's what's happening now right and you know some of these people are like even like i can call them my friends they're my younger friends and i i'm like i don't really agree with that because i wouldn't tell them what to do and i'm sorry but i've been doing this for 15 plus years competitively and still don't feel like my information i provide them with is secure or sound enough for them to be safe right so what do you know that i don't i don't know and i know there's a lot of long words getting thrown about now a lot of people are educated on you know blood work and all these words but even with what's science based and put out there science and what actually happens are two different things sometimes you know science might say this won't affect you at all you'll be fine but in reality it's a different story and i think just many coaches have just are just copycats they're doing what somebody else has put out there aren't like, they let's all? Say Black or j3 university and they're well, just did, yeah. copying they don't understand well, it well what did i say to you earlier how easy it is to like hear something and then just pass it on regurgitate it I always wanted to ask why, so I can learn why. Because I don't, I could, I could regurgitate everything I've ever been told to do and make someone else do it, and they'll probably do well. You know, I could be like, yeah, take forty micrograms of clenbuterol all day, uh, twelve point five T three and a hundred mcg of T four, and the guy's gonna get in shape. Everybody does. Yeah, guy's gonna get in shape, but it's generic shit. Yeah. Like it's, and I can sound intelligent if I want. I'll just put on my, you know, my show voice. But, and people are happy to do that. People are happy to do that because that's how they get there. And that's just doesn't sit well with me, man. So yeah. that's my opinion on that part of today's. You know, and I think that's problem. super important to say. Thank you. Thank you for that. No worries, man. Appreciate it. All right. Uh, I want to make that switch because you said you are at a certain age and you came to the conclusion that you want to collect moments. Yeah. That you want to make your life meaningful. Sure. And... I've been following you for a long time and it turns out that you have many talents and hobbies besides bodybuilding. You're into gaming, skating, um, mountain climbing, you've climbed Kilimanjaro, right? Yeah. And you even took a year off to just not compete and focus on you and your life and everything. So you've seen different aspects in life apart from bodybuilding. Yeah, My question absolutely. now is what brought you back into this sport? And can you still obtain that balance? Is balance possible as a professional athlete who tries to be at the top? Um, you know, what brings you back is what makes your heart beat the most. Um, and there's, you know, if there's a thirst, like an unquenchable thirst, it's very hard to avoid and i'm still trying to figure out whether that thirst is god talking to me or the devil <laughs> and i always say this because it feels like yeah because it always feels like every choice you make in life it could be the devil in disguise or it could be god and i'm not saying i'm a religious person what i mean is that there's good and bad that comes from decision making and you don't know because we don't have hindsight um and what can sound like a positive thing can literally be a whisper coming from Satan himself, making it sound attractive, you know, or it could be legitimately that that is the right thing. And I suppose I'm just going through life, just trying to figure out who have I been listening to this whole time. <laughs> and that's kind of it. And I'm like that every day. Um, and what brought me back to bodybuilding is, you know, unfinished businesses. Also, 
wow, look at the body, but it's given me a life financially. Like, why would I step away when it, it, it only goes up? I've been so fortunate that my career from a financial standpoint has gone for the last however many years. So, you know, you're, it's funny because you get people on like social media, like, oh man, you ain't, why bother with a bodybuilding? You ain't doing that well. Like not being egotistical. If they knew what I earn, they'd probably want to do what I do because I'm living pretty all right. I'm not saying I'm a millionaire, but right. I own a gym. Um, and that didn't come for free. So it's like, just, you can do well as long as you're not an arsehole. And as long as you work hard and you're willing to put yourself out there and connect and, uh, I've always found just fortunately enough being myself has been enough so far and I hope it continues to be because I feel like being yourself is the most important thing you can be. Um, but yeah, I think that it was just uh, not feeling like I'm done yet. Um, I do kind of have a time frame, you know, I'm not going to compete past like 37, 38. I've probably got a couple more seasons in me. How old are um, you now? 35. So maybe two more years of competing if okay. everything's good. Um and that would see me good. And if I can get done what I set out to do, then I'll be happy. If not, I got a lot higher than I expected for wanting more. And I say this to everybody, like, set your ambitions high. Um, because that way, no matter what happens, you would have gone further than if you just didn't set an ambition at all. Um, you know, even if you don't quite reach the pinnacle, you'll be much closer to the pinnacle for having tried than for not having tried. So, you know, I can already look at my career as a success from where I came from. Even winning the British overall and turning pro, could have called it a day there. And I would have been, in England, they would have been like, as one of our best. Yeah. Um, and then it's just down to you. What do you want from there? How much more do you want to try and squeeze out? You know, yeah. are you happy with what you got? If you are, fair enough. Are you content? If you are, fair enough. If there's a part of you inside that's just like still desires more, fair enough. There's no right or wrong answer. And I just know that every time I come out of a show and I get a little bit of time to rest and calibrate myself and re-evaluate everything, that I've got a little bit more in me and I'm happy to keep going. Especially knowing that I get to form relationships with people like Stefan and whatnot that, that I can't do if I'm not competing. So... I enjoy that side of it as well. Just like getting to meet people, getting to talk. Um, also still being a guy that the younger generation reach out to and say, you know, I want to be where you are. And then I can give something back to them by showing them what hard work does and it gets you somewhere. So I take privilege and I suppose I take most privilege and I keep going mostly for what it does for other people rather than what it does for me actually in the minute. Really? Yeah, like I'm more I'm more motivated knowing that people are behind me because it gives them encouragement. Because uh, I'm not like genetically one of the elite. I'm not mm -hmm. the guy that was meant to get to the Olympia. Like if you look at me, but I did, and I've done it, qualified for the Olympia three times somehow. Yeah. So yeah, the way I look at it is if I can do it, then a lot of these people out there that are young and maybe sometimes question their ability, now they got a reason to keep trying because someone like me managed you know and now i'm like fuck it let's just see how far i can go you know if i could squeeze out a big win at one of the shows or do really well at one of them damn then that's good as well you've just said that you've reached things that you would never expected you yeah. went to the olympia for three times yeah still you've said that there was unfinished business yeah what's this... the ultimate goal what's your ambition in what do you it's, want to reach in the next two years if I if black and white, like if there's a show I'd want to win, it's the Arnold Classic. Okay. That's like if I just straight up pull it how I want, could I retire after? Yes. You know, that's my goal. And if it doesn't happen, then I did well. But I would love to retire as an Arnold Classic champion and be invited back there every year and sit on the chairs with the boys and be like, well, you know, I did all right. <laughs> and you give yourself two years to do so. Yeah. Two years with a good coach yeah, and uh, no rush, firm plan and, and me giving it my 100% and not selling myself short. And if it doesn't happen in that, I'll probably at least bring the best James I've ever seen and be proud of the pictures. You know, what else can you ask for? Yeah. Wish you best Sorry. of luck for that. Thank you, man. I'm um, gonna quickly, while we're on this podcast, because my Lou's right there, because I like to go to Lou halfway through. I'm going to go to the Lou really quickly so we can resume on a new question. 
So All right. It'll be one minute. This All is right. why the James the shed break. <laughs> it's only because I'm drinking a lot at the minute and I don't eat many carbs. So <laughs> I'll literally be one minute. All right. No problem. That was quick. I, I know because my restroom is literally just on the other side of this wall. So it's perfect. <laughs> What I wanted to know is, um, a few years ago, you talked about feeling shackled by bodybuilding. You coined the term, I guess. Yeah. Can you tell us what you meant by that? What was happening back then? Mm. It's funny you say that. I opened a diary that I must have started writing the other day. I don't know where I put it. And it's funny, I read it. And it's like I'm a different person. It says something along the lines of, if anyone in the outside world was watching me while I write this, they would think I'm not okay and they wouldn't know whether it's something along the lines like they wouldn't they'd say that I'm lost. And it's funny because I've always journaled on and off in the moment, just whether it be good or bad. And the trend is, is this like life just goes up and down for everybody. I have mm -hmm. friends reaching out to me the other day who are like, my life's perfect, but yet I feel hollow. I feel like there's nothing here even though I've set my life up to be the best it can be. And then other times, those same friends, I'll hear them laughing and having a great time. And I suppose the older I've got, the more I realize is that there's no, there's no straight path. Like how I felt then, I don't think it's a bad thing. It was a necessary thing. And whatever it was going on at the time is real life. Um, and it'll probably come again, you know, because the way that we feel, it's not linear. It is like everything in life. There are no straight lines. Things are waves. And for life to be experienced in its fullest, waves have to occur because you have to understand the severity of the change, you know, understanding what the bottom feels like to understand how good it feels at the top. Um, and I think that was just a time where I felt like that. And maybe I was caught on a podcast and I, just wanted to speak because I felt like I needed to speak out because sometimes the best way is to speak out. Um, maybe I felt like I couldn't be better at what I do. That I'm giving it my all and that uh, I had a lack of faith in my ability. Perhaps it was after Patrick and I felt quite down about that. Um, again, it all depends when it came. And, you know, sometimes when I felt like that, what happens afterwards is normally I catapult up and bounce back. Uh, because when you're at your lowest, there's only an opportunity to go up. Mm. So I always find that when I've performed well, it's normally after I felt really quite bad. Um, almost as a response to myself to say, nah, man, like you don't need to feel this way. Sort it out. Get on your, you know, get off your ass, do something positive and make something happen. Uh, and that happens every few years for me. Like it, it isn't... Um, it's like seasons, you know, rain comes when it's, you know, winter time, snow and ice, but in the summer it shines bright. And that's the same with life. It's very cyclic, it just goes around. And uh, I talk to people so frequently that I realize that majority of man feels like that. And it's so not, un it's not uncommon at all. And the only reason it sometimes feels uncommon is because it, like typically people don't want to speak on it because they feel like, one, a lot of the time they feel like that they don't want to burden anyone else. But also a lot of the time they do want to suffer because when you feel bad about yourself, sometimes you don't want help. Um, you almost writhe in the trying to suppress yourself because humans are strange. And I notice I've done it to myself. When I'm like feeling a bit negative, I don't want help. I'm like, no, I don't need help. Fuck off, leave me alone. And you almost try and dig a bigger hole and feel more hurt. Because at the time, you're almost, you're so consumed with negative energy that that's what you're attracting and you continue to do that. And it just gets harder and harder to accept anything positive until it gets to breaking point and you're like, nah, something has to change. But I've been there many times, man, ever since I was a kid. And that's just from growing up, you know, with a dad that wasn't there and seeing a mum, I suppose, struggle to keep a, a roof over your head and feeling inadequate because you can't support her financially and then you know even to growing up i got to, my bodybuilding didn't really start financially sorting me out until after she died and i felt so bad about that because i always promised her an easier future i was always like man i'm gonna be that that bodybuilder that does really well that my mom's gonna come home to a car on the driveway with a ribbon on it 
like and then you know she was gone and now i couldn't do that i was like i don't really know what i'm doing there was a long time after my mom died where i'm like i don't know why i'm bodybuilding because as a child and i say child meaning even growing up as a young man my intentions of my bodybuilding were to one provide financially for my mom but two to just get her happy and then give her like a reason to live oh look at my son he's doing well and then when they're no longer here to witness that because i don't bodybuild really for myself i found it hard to bodybuild because i was like i can't do this just for me because it isn't it's too lame it doesn't have enough substance to it i'm a deep thinker and to just lift weights and look good doesn't carry enough weight for me to continue going on unless it brings something to others and that's what I was trying to say earlier. The only reason I can keep going so well is because I've been reached out to by an audience enough that they tell me it gives them positive light. Because if this was based just on me looking in the mirror and trying to have a physique, oh man, I would have stopped a long time ago because it's not enough for me. My brain requires more stimulation than that. So. Thank you. It's like being honest. It's nice to be truthful and speak, you know? Yeah. I've got a question for you. Do you think that you working out and you pursuing the dream of being a bodybuilder, a successful bodybuilder, has something to do with the promise that you gave your mom? Uh, without a doubt. That's everything. Everything. Is that now, your now unfinished my, business? Yeah. Now my mom's not here. It's now my audience. Like they've, they've mm -hmm. almost taken that seat. So young men or young women that reach out and they just say something. Like, I've had some personal messages from people where someone in their life's going through cancer or some stuff like that. And they're like, oh, I train, you've made me feel better. All of those little comments, they almost add up and they are my mum. So it's like, yeah, like, it, you know what I mean? <laughs> it's weird. Like, because I think about her, I don't like let her come through too much, but I'm really happy that we're able to talk about it because I can almost see her in all the whispers of these people that come to me and, when you add them up into a big portrait, it's like my mom's face. Like, so if my mom's energy was like somewhat dispersed after she passed, it's almost like it's gone into all this, these people that reach out to me and I get a little piece of her from each of those that ask me to keep going. And I'm like, yes, I'll, I'll keep going because you guys give me what I was getting and, uh, and nothing would make me happier than to be able to see you, uh, an expo or the Arnold say shake hand and say thank you for encouraging me because you encouraging me is like a symbiotic relationship it gives back to you but it also really really helps me know that I have a purpose because the purpose was lost for a long long time so yeah oh I actually had another question here which I now don't even dare to ask actually no, ask but, that. Um, please. I wanted to know if, like, let's say in one or two years, looking back at your career and knowing that a few years ago you felt like you were shackled, you were not like progressing anymore, and you were afraid of missing out. You had different things in life. You you told us that you want to climb mountains again. Yeah. You wanted to do other things, and you were really doubting if bodybuilding was the the one thing for you and i was just curious if you might have any regrets or resentment looking back at your career but now like, listening to you i think yeah. i can answer the question well, it kind myself. of answers yeah it does kind of answer because like i say at a time when i the, the interim where my mum was gone and i didn't quite have this relationship with the audience there was yeah. that time in between that felt like that yeah i'm like well this isn't giving me anything so i need to go and find something new and i was you know recollecting on all the things that have given me some level of joy in the past especially like climbing kilimanjaro the freedom mm -hmm. uh and that's why i use the word shackle because it's almost like freedom is the opposite to shackle exactly and when i was on the mountain all i had was air and time and it felt very, very, very relieving on a, a level, you know, spiritually, physically, mentally, emotionally, 
Um, so I was thirsty, very thirsty for that sensation again while I was in that, while I was in this dark period. Um, and I, I still think those times will be incredible and they're still there ahead. Mm -hmm. And I would love to go there and revisit those feelings. Um, and that's why I say to you, I, regardless of what I want from bodybuilding, you have to be sensible and put a time frame on it so that you can allow yourself enough time to also, I suppose, water, nurture and feed that part of you that is just as important that doesn't quite get the same attention yet. Um, you know, I can put something on hold and not feed it for a while to create opportunity and future and security, but I can't pull it off forever because ultimately that is going to be the most important thing to you at some point. And as you get older, like we said, you start to realize that side of you definitely draws your attention more and definitely one day will be so present that you wake up and you're like, today has to change. And today is the day kind of thing. You'll just wake up one day and you go, you know, I'm not eating chicken and rice this morning. I'm going for, I'm getting on the, I'm getting on the computer and I'm booking a ticket to Africa and I'm going up the mountain. <laughs> Got to be as spontaneous as that. And the day it will be, it will come. It will come. Yeah. Just a matter of when. Are you willing to invest whatever it takes in the next two years? Not whatever it takes. I wouldn't put myself on a deathbed for bodybuilding. Mm -hmm. But I believe to be your best and physically look your best, it doesn't require that. What is your opinion on people who, in this bodybuilding bubble, maybe don't are not even pros yet, oh, they're, they're killing but have that whatever it takes mentality and do everything to look their personal best and even risk their health and neglect everything else in their lives because i've been in this this fitness industry for a few years now and i feel like that we have a very a lot of narrow minded people people who are not even like don't, don't even have the potential to win a pro show or, or even be be a pro and they invest everything into the sport and are neglecting all the other wealth that this life has to offer it's really tough for me because I remember how I was and I know to get where I got, I had a mentality like that. I didn't do any socializing. I chose bodybuilding all the time. I was really militant, but I also look at, you know, when I did it, it the times were different. I didn't know of the risks. So they weren't even present to me to even doubt myself or think that I was doing any damage if I was as aware of what risks are present as present day, I probably would have approached things very differently and maybe not have had the opinion that I did. So now when I look at young people, I, even a friend of mine today, I was like, don't rush this man. Like, don't let a coach tell you to take this, take that just to get you there quicker. I said, you're progressing nicely. You can be where you want to be, but just don't rush because one thing you don't want to do is destroy your brain and destroy your love for this sport. So it's funny you say that because we said that today. So that that, that happens a lot. Um, I think it was easier to not be distracted when I was younger because there was none of this social media. Mm -hmm. So you knew that your passion for bodybuilding was genuine because if you continue to pursue something that's not even blasted in your face, you love it. Let's be real. Yes. Like I'm waking up every day wanting the bodybuilding yet, even though there's no influence from bodybuilding, I've chose to be influenced to be a bodybuilder. The difference now is that everyone goes on the internet and fitness industry is rammed down your throat. And if you're not fit and you're not healthy and you're not a bodybuilder, you're not cool, which again, it's quite a sad time to be in because I wonder how it would be as a young man. Now, if you're not in shape, Like, do you get, do you get called names? Like, I don't even know. I don't know because I'm not in any other industry, but it just feels like it's a lot of peer pressure. So I kind of feel sorry for them at the same time as, as feel bad that they are willing to, like you say, kill themselves to be Mr. Olympia, so-called. Um, it's, it's very hard because it's not a linear answer. Yeah. Because it comes down to the individual because there are really some genuinely good people out there as, I mean, like good soul, good people, they care, they, And they still make dumb decisions because they're young. Young. I was one of them. I was young and I was willing to do whatever. I was just fortunate that whatever back then wasn't as aggressive as now. 
you know the 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 insulin wasn't even a question you know growth hormone wasn't even a question now every tom dick and harry is taking lantus insulin first thing in the morning to keep themselves insulin sensitive or taking metformin before bed or taking thyroid so they don't get fat and that was never a thing when i was younger so the dangers come with the evolution of the drugs and the pushing of higher dosages and stuff like that i think it's good to have a mentality that's do whatever it takes but not in the climate of today because doing whatever it takes doesn't have to be dangerous if what's involved isn't dangerous it's like playing football you know soccer do whatever it takes that being training every day kicking a ball every day practicing every day that's a brilliant mindset that's the best mindset but when it's a bodybuilding one it's do whatever it takes and that automatically thinks oh I'll take as much as i can take that's where the problems occur because that isn't about talent or drive or focus or ambition. That's about like an obsession and a, an addiction and a need. And that's where the line really needs to be cut because to be the best, you do need the whatever it takes mentality, but it has to be applied to the doing of rather than the taking of. And that's the only way I can really answer that truthfully. So if someone's listening to this as young, do have the whatever it takes mentality, but in the variables that are important. Pressure. don't have it in the drug side because the drug side will kill you or it will make you batshit crazy and go mental and you'll fall out of love of body building anyway because it'll do shit to your head that you never expected so do whatever it takes when it gets to gym work and it gets to nutrition and a little bit of what we call the supplements that's just there to assist it should never be the primary focus and if it is the primary focus you're a drug addict. <laughs> proof, put, yeah. You know, it's and I'm not even. I'm not. I, listen, I can talk because I, I've done a lot of fucking drugs, so I'm even trying to, you know, learn myself. Am I too far? Am I? A, a, am I an addict? You know. So I always use my experiences to try and teach the younger yeah. or the newer. Yeah. Um, I wouldn't want anyone to even end up having done cycles as long as I have, or been competitively bodybuilding for as long as i have like dorian had it right i know he got injured but he didn't have a long competitive career and he probably had the perfect length career Absolutely. you know so again i can only pass on from experience and that would be how i would answer that to the best of my ability do you personally think that things have changed to the good or to the bad it's both both man there's good and bad with everything comes good and bad it's very you can't just say it's all bad and you can't say it's all good there's some great talent out there people are aware that they can pursue bodybuilding uh that they wouldn't have been aware of bodybuilding before because it just wasn't shown to them but at the same time like you say now everybody has a dream to be a bodybuilder and unfortunately some of those people are pre have pre disposed issues that will haunt them haunt them in the future so they could have medical issues or something they're not even aware of take some shit do some shit and probably notice that they're getting very ill health because they're just not meant to do bodybuilding all the things that come with it you know and that's the problem when it's so widespread more bodies in the the maths you know the formula becomes the equation is bigger so if there's more people in it more things to go right but also more things to go wrong and we're going to see more go wrong because the negative news spreads you know way quicker than the positive so there's good and bad now that you've talked about the negative news how does that make you feel when you read the news that another bodybuilder has passed or it's always sad that it's always sad and uh, there was been times when i'm in these dark loops that i'm like it's me next you know like i'm like, i don't want to die but it's me next because I feel such a dark place that you feel like that's what you deserve. And you're like, I've done everything wrong. I've done my whole life's been wrong. My mm -hmm. decisions have been wrong. Um, but I don't know. Cause it's like anything, isn't it? There's such light shone on it. People die every day, you know, and things can go wrong. I'm always marveled at how all of us are still alive after this many years thinking about how many processes are involved in the bodybuilding yeah. and living in itself, how many cells, how many vessels, how many nerves, neurons, like if one goes wrong, lights out. So the fact that I start functioning daily and things aren't going wrong, I'm actually surprised. But obviously with the lifestyles that are extreme, 
becomes more um I suppose more opportunity for negative to happen, you know, stress on the body um, and unknown responses. Like I was just saying to you then in regards to like underlying health issues, no one knows they have one until it's like too late normally. So I think a lot of these deaths come from that. I think the majority of healthy people that don't have those issues would probably be fine, but there's always going to be some, you know, you're gonna bite your nails and be like, oh shit, another bodybuilder's dead. Mm -hmm. Because obviously you see those words in a sentence and it strikes fear in bodybuilders like myself, because you just think your lifestyle's killing you. Mm -hmm. But bodybuilding, if done correctly, probably one of the best ways to approach life if you're not an idiot. Imagine you was like, you know, imagine if you had your blood's actually done and you then went away and you actually fulfilled the requirements of what your blood work determines testosterone everything and ate a really variety a very diet and trained you'd probably live the longest life it's when things are taken to the extreme and beyond is that when it becomes uh problematic and obviously it's the same with uh you know i suppose any sport you know if you push the boundaries of what's being done there's more likelihood for accident and i wonder if a lot of these guys that pass away it's like, is it the underlying issues or is it that they pushed it so hard that they just, the risks were so high that eventually it was going to get them? You know, it's, yeah. it's normally one or the other, isn't it? Like some of the bodybuilders that you see pass away look like they were going to pass away. Do you know what I mean? They're like, wow, they didn't look too good in life. But then other times it's a shock. It's some young dude who then, oh, he had, he had a kidney problem. He didn't even know. So, I think that's the main cause. People don't yeah. know that after uh, and it's any medical predis Absolutely. predisposition. Jesus Christ. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So I, that's why I think you have chosen a rather healthy approach with setting a time limit to it and um, not doing whatever it takes. And that's why you choose certain coaches as well. Exactly. You could be honest to Stefan. You could say, Stefan, look, I'm only willing to do this, man. Can we eke out as much progress as possible with what I'm willing to do? You say, yeah, sure, man. That's what you want. What are your plans after your active career? Um, Have you ever thought about that? I do. But then, I, you know, I I travel. I think of traveling. And I will always be involved in bodybuilding. I'd love to always go to events. So, you know, this past week, I was at the NPC Sweden. And I had a, mm -hmm. an amazing time. Mm -hmm. I always do over there. And I would love to just do more with Gasp forever because I love Gasp. You know, Michael Johansson. He was on this podcast already. Dude, he's great. He's he's he, I, he's a great friend of mine. Yeah. He's a great like Such boss. A guy. Yeah. You know, um, and I just have a good time around people like him. He's one of them. He's one of them people I'm talking about earlier that memories and energy. You know, I can be around him and sit and have dinner at his house and just feel like I've come away from it grown you know in some manner so I, I plan on always being involved with gasp in the industry obviously if a supplement company wishes to have me you know represent them for as long as possible even if i'm not competing i'd love that you know because i know with gasp like me and michael have had these conversations he's like james i don't care if you ever compete again like you're the the message is you and what you're about and you can see that in the brand especially how he um you know he has Branch there, he has Johnny, he has guys that don't compete no more, still very much involved. And uh, I love that about Gasp because that's like everyone says that companies are family. There's not many that are, but Gasp literally is. Um, so, yeah, if I can get involved, maybe with promoting shows, helping shows, I don't know, whatever. But I love bodybuilding. It's, done, it's given me my, my home and my life. So I don't want to walk away from it. I will be involved in some manner forever. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, after bodybuilding for myself physically get fitter you know get you know a little bit lighter and get a bit more mobile a bit more flexible and um definitely travel and give yourself some more challenges that are just different because you should always have challenges because challenges are going to keep your life the minute you're no longer feeling to be challenged is things are going to just start slowing down i was listening to something the other day i don't know how true it is but it's about a certain part of your brain if you're the type of person that can resist things, say no to things you want, that part of your brain, it develops and it's been shown to be larger in athletes and successful people. Um, and they say, instead of looking at it like that's 
a key to like the willpower side. It's actually a key to living longer because uh, these people typically live longer as well. So challenges are obviously discomfort and discomfort. If you can resist discomfort and, you know, compose yourself and push through, I feel like that is what keeps you alive. The essence of life itself. So you can't just end a career and call it a day and do nothing. Mm -hmm. You have to have something that gives you reason to wake up in the morning to get on, you know, get on the road, get in the car and head somewhere. So that's why training is always a good thing to do, even in the background, because that will always be some sort of purpose, regardless of what else is going on in life. Yeah. It sounds like a good plan. Me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just making sure it makes sense to me that it does. It does. It does. And it Obviously, I like, like to develop other plan. skills. Like we'd all like to be better at something like, you know, I've always thought about maybe even when I'm older, just like going to, you know, go back to college and learn carpentry just for two years. Just see so you're like really good at doing something else and you can just have a hobby. Even if I never did a day's work in carpentry, but I knew yeah. I could work with wood, you might find me in a cabin in Norway making, you know, wooden figures just because I've learned the craft. So why not? So I don't know. Music, maybe learn to play, I don't know, piano, something. There'll be something. There'll be something. For sure. It sounds like you have lots, lots of ideas, at least. <laughs> There's infinite possibilities. Listen, we're very fortunate as human beings to be able to do all the things and expressions. It's the amount of expressions that are available to us because we're quite intelligent species, you know? Like, no other animal's going to be like, oh, let's learn to play the guitar. Like, it's, <laughs> it's kind of crazy how many things we do have at our disposal. So it'd be a bit of a crime, wouldn't it, to waste potential? Right, absolutely. Yeah, man. Thank you. You've just talked about maybe you can work with a supplement sponsor for longer. Yeah. And before that we start recording, uh, I asked James if we can share the news with you guys. And we so, figured out that this podcast will be after my contract starts. So yes, we can. Will. Okay. We can. So. So for the visual visual viewers, I'm going to give the listeners a little bit less, a little bit more time to guess, but. Um, Yeah, I just signed with uh, Elite Sport Nutrition, so ESN, German-based brand, really good products. I've been using their products for a, about a month because they sent me a package to try because I'd never join a team without knowing the product. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's a really like shallow thing to do. Just go, yeah, give me money and I'll just promote it whether I like it or not. Um, obviously, I've got friends that are already with the company. Nathan Diash is a good friend of mine. He's always spoke very highly of them. Um, obviously Stefan's a huge part of ESN and what they're about. Um, and you know, I communicate with some of the other guys and everyone I know that's part of it is happy and good vibes, good products. Like I say, I've been slamming the protein down, been taking the Amigas, all the things I need, curcumin, you know, all the good products. So very easy move for me. Very easy move for me. My contract was coming to an end, literally the end of May anyway, after two years. Okay. And uh, I wanted to change and I thought it was a great way to go forward because I actually really want to focus on my European market as such. Like I want to travel to Europe more and meet people. I've never been to FIBO, for example. No. So I plan. No, really? so I, exactly. It's crazy. So I plan on next year, like being, well, this year even, but like when events This year happen, was crazy. Yeah, I, I want to be around for that. So yeah. this is a great opportunity for me to be able to work with a very active company that cares a lot about getting the athletes out there with the content side of things as well. You know, they're very helpful when it comes to media and stuff, which I love doing. I do have my own YouTube channel and I've just started doing videos again. Um, you so know. there will probably be collaborations with... For sure, one. loads. I'd love to do some... I'd love to have like Urs and Wesley over at the gym. Mm -hmm. Nathan's always welcome down. Nathan's actually uh, trained by JP Cloven athlete as well. So, he, so he's signed to... Jordan, so he mm -hmm. comes down. So yeah, I just it's gonna be some good times ahead. I'm just looking forward to it. Like this is why I don't mind if I don't compete immediately because there's plenty of other things I can do at the minute yeah, yeah. that are very fruitful and fulfilling. When are you going to to Vienna? Soon as I'm in Texas uh, on the eighth of the month to the twelfth with Anf Bales and Charlie Marden. Charlie owns uh, Ultraflex Gyms. Yeah, we're going for like a little lads training trip for four days. And then once I'm back, I'm going to try and pencil in with um, Stefan when mm -hmm. it's good for him. Um, and then, yeah, so it should be maybe end second half of May, hopefully. Um, 
and then in June I'm actually back in Texas for the Branch Warren Productions, uh, one of his shows, doing a guest post. So I've got like a nice few things lined up, and I'm looking forward to being able to go to these events as an ESN athlete mm -hmm. and represent. You know, take some product with me show some people and just like kind of raise some awareness to anyone that's not aware now because that's the fun part of the job as well and your visit to stefan will probably be filmed and recorded by yeah i'm up for that yeah on YouTube, it would YouTube it'd make sense it'd make sense um that'd be great i'd love to nice. do that nice. so i'll put it on my youtube so and i've asked you before and i'll ask you again if people german community listens to this podcast and they feel like you they want to support you They can already do this with your code at ESM, sure, correct? Man. Yeah, man. Code SHED. SHED, literally SHED. If that's your way of supporting, that's great S -H -E -D, for me. S-H-E-D, SHED. If you want to support James and if you want to save some money, yeah, use that code on your next sure. ESM order. Yeah, man. And absolutely. And let me know what you think of the product if you're not already a user. I'm, I'm, sure, I'm sure a lot of the German guys are already very They're much familiar. informed and familiar. So <laughs> um, this is more a chance for me to become familiar with you guys which is great for me. So, I th and also, you know, obviously this is an opportunity for the UK to get more aware of ESN. So you're going to be far more available in the UK. I am actually going to try and sort out also having stuff at the gym. Um, So I actually had a little message back and forth today about potentially lining up some stuff because some of the products I really, really, really love. There's one product in particular without pushing too hard. It's just an energy drink in a can that I really like. Mm -hmm. Um, And if I can get that in the gym, I'll have it in the gym. So anyone that comes to visit the shed, you should be able to sample a couple of bits as well. And I'll probably have some stock. And then obviously you can go onto the website and, you know, get what you like. So should be good, man. I'm really, really cool. You know, really, it's just really insane happy about it. how much ESN is expanding at the moment. Crazy. I don't know if you've heard that they've even signed a German national football player. There you go. I've, I've, yeah, because they've just started doing, Thomas they got Miller? this line. Yeah, I think Nathan posted it. And I've also seen that they're doing like a more, There's a line they're doing now with the supplements that is based more around sport. Endurance, uh, yeah. Yeah, the endurance line. So that's really cool as well. So it's crazy. They're just doing big things, man. And I'm yeah. honored that that I was even considered. So massive thank you to ESN and uh, the guys over there. In particular, I have to say thank you to Isabel because she was the first point of contact. So thank you, Isabel, if you hear this. So best of luck with ESN. And I think that the German community will get to know you better in the next months because I, hope so. i plan on it man i'm getting my ass over there to come see you yeah. guys yeah so i'm happy to see you at fever next time 100 i'm there i'm there all the time all day every day nice. <laughs> um and really i wish you best of luck i hope that you and stefan will kill it in the next thank few you, years i hope i want to see you on the olympia thank you man and i honestly wish you to fulfill your dream of being an arnold classic champion thank you if It's... i do get that dude You'll high, you're the first it's a high ambition goal, but dude, you'll know because as soon as I win on stage, I'll say, Cheers, everybody. It's been a great run. That's me done. Thanks, guys. <laughs> <laughs> And with that, thank you for being on. Thanks, man. It was an honor for me. Great pleasure. Thanks. I was super nervous, but um, thank you for everything. Dude, had a great time. Really appreciate the conversations. And guys, if you like this podcast, you know put it in the comments. Follow James Hollingshead on Instagram. Support him on ESN. And yeah, if there's anything yeah. else, let me know in the comment section below. So this is going on YouTube, yeah? It is. So remember, guys, click the bell notification, subscribe, and then you can check out all of the previous podcasts and all the ones in the future as well. So support the channel. That's how channels grow. So I appreciate yeah. you guys. Thank Thanks you, James. For me on. So appreciate most it. of the videos are in German, but if you want to have a look at the video that I did with Samson Daughter or Michael Johansson, You just have to scroll down and find it there. You can always put subtitles on as well if you do want to go back to German. <laughs> Surely. Can you do that? <laughs> All right. Thank you, guys, and see you next time. Bye, guys. Goodbye. Bye.